Welcome. So in the last couple of videos, what we focused on was the process we go through to create a plasmid construct, where the plasmid construct's purpose is to enable the expression of a gene of interest in a host cell such as E. coli. In this video, what we are going to address is how do we go about introducing that plasmid construct into a host E. coli cell or some other similar cell. So by the end of this video, you should be able to outline the steps required to take a plasmid construct that you've created and introduce that into an E. coli cell. So what we will focus on here in this schematic is taking this plasmid construct that we made in the last couple of videos and introducing that into our E. coli cell. The E. coli cell I'm representing is this black circle here. So we'll focus on this part. And then ultimately the purpose of creating this construct is so that that gene will be expressed by the E. coli cell and the resulting protein product that is encoded by that gene can be applied in future experiments or for practical applications such as um, a variety of different peptide-based drugs are produced by this type of system of expressing the gene that encodes for that protein product in E. coli and then that protein product can be bottled up and used as a drug. So how do we go about introducing the plasmid construct into a host? That is the basis for this discussion. And that's our goal of this discussion is to answer that question. So when we are introducing a plasmid construct into a host, E. coli cell, the first thing we need to keep in mind is that a general E. coli cell that is present in the environment or present in the lab even, is not going to be particularly amenable to accepting this foreign plasmid. Instead, in order for that foreign plasmid to be able to relatively effectively enter the E. coli cell, the E. coli cell has to be made competent. So the first key term I'm gonna write down here is competent. A competent cell is a cell that has been chemically or enzymatically treated to enable the cell membrane to accept foreign DNA. So the competent cell will have been treated either chemically, and generally if it's chemical treatment, it has been treated with a high salinity solution, such as a high concentration of calcium chloride, or an enzyme, such as lysozyme, that weakens the cell membrane. And by weakening the cell membrane, what we do is make that cell membrane more amenable and more tolerant of allowing the passage of these plasmids. Because the plasmid is relatively large, it's generally 3,000 to 10,000 base pairs in size, and so processes such as diffusion that allow very small molecules into and out of the cell is simply not going to work here. So in order for the plasma to be introduced into the cell, we absolutely have to be working with cells that are so-called competent. Once we've generated cells that are competent, there are two strategies that we can use to transform the E. coli cells, the competent E. coli cells, with the plasmid of interest. So we're gonna walk through those two processes of transformation here. So we have two ways to go about transforming our E. coli cells, and specifically we're looking at competent E. coli cells. One of those ways that we can transform competent E. coli cells is through what's referred to as heat shock. In heat shock, what is going to happen, as the name sort of implies, is that we are going to control the temperature of the system where the E. coli is incubated with the plasmid construct to facilitate the entry of that plasmid construct into a competent cell. So for heat shock, there are some variations on this procedure depending upon exactly what cells you're using. But in general, what happens is that the cells, which are referred to as chemically competent cells, Now remember that competent term 
indicates that the cells have been treated so that they are suitable for the introduction of foreign DNA because their cell membrane has been weakened. So we mix chemically competent cells with that plasmid construct, generally cool that mixture on ice, and then heat for a brief period of time, generally under a minute. And that process is one of the ways to introduce the plasmid into the cell. The second way to introduce the plasmid into a cell is a process referred to as electroporation. What happens in electroporation is that the cells that are competent, and specifically we refer to these cells as being electrocompetent, Those electrocompetent cells are mixed with the plasmid construct. And in order to introduce the DNA into the cell, an electric pulse is applied. Now, you'll notice if you look closely here that we used a couple of different terms here to describe the competent cells for heat shock versus electroporation. We referred to the ones used for heat shock as being chemically competent, and the ones used for electroporation as being electrocompetent. That is no coincidence or no random chance there. Um, instead, what is the case is for electroporation, the cells that are electrocompetent have been treated in a very specific way so that they are suitable for being uh, subjected to this electric pulse. To be a little more specific about that, with the electrocompetent cells, the treatment process that they undergo to weaken the cell membrane is a treatment process that ultimately gives cells that are not present in a high salinity solution. So one of the ways we talked about making chemically competent cells was a high salinity solution. The problem with that is when electroporation is attempted with high salinity solutions, it will cause the electricity, the electrical pulse to arc and um, that will not facilitate the entry of the foreign DNA into the cell. So the electrocompetent cells are in a relatively low salinity environment. On the other hand, the chemically competent cells for the heat shock are more typically placed into a high salinity environment as their way of making them competent, weakening the cell membrane so that the foreign DNA can be introduced through this systematic heating and cooling process known as heat shock. So after the cells are transformed by heat shock or electroporation, what comes next? What is the next thing that we need to do here in order to continue this? Well, next up on the list is that we need to be able to identify E. coli that have taken in the foreign DNA because through the process of heat shock and electroporation, we're not going to introduce the plasmid into 100% of the E. coli cells that are present in a container. Instead, only some of those individual cells will have successfully accepted the foreign DNA. And so we need a way to differentiate between the cells that have accepted the foreign DNA of the plasmid and those that haven't. This is where the antibiotic resistance gene that was encoded on the plasmid comes in. So after we transform the competent cells, generally what is done is that those are incubated for a relatively short period of time, such as an hour. And the purpose of incubating for a short period of time is to enable the plasmid genes to start being expressed within the cell. This is important because the plasmid is where the antibiotic resistance gene is encoded, and so some time is needed for that antibiotic resistance gene to start being transcribed and translated so that the cell actually becomes antibiotic resistant. The cell is not instantaneously antibiotic resistant. That antibiotic resistance is dependent upon the antibiotic resistance gene being transcribed and translated. And so you have to give the cells a bit of time for that process to kick in and for the cell to actually become antibiotic resistant. So you'll incubate a short time to enable the transcription 
and translation of the antibiotic resistance gene. And I'm going to abbreviate the antibiotic resistance gene as A, B, superscript R. And once that antibiotic resistance gene has been transcribed and translated, then what the experimenter does is plates out that cell mixture that has been subject to electroporation or heat shock onto a petri dish that contains bacterial media, or in other words, the food that the bacteria likes to eat, plus auger, which is the agent that allows the media, allows the food to solidify onto the plate. And that plate also contains the antibiotic. So you would have a petri dish here that is full of food for the bacteria to eat on a solid substrate here. And incorporated into that throughout is also the antibiotic that corresponds to the antibiotic resistance gene that is in the plasmid. And so as a result, when that mixture of cells is plated on this petri dish, the only cells that will grow are going to be the ones that have the antibiotic resistance gene that has been transcribed and translated. In other words, only the cells that are expressing the antibiotic resistance gene from the plasmid will grow on this plate. And after being incubated overnight or so, what will be seen is that colonies will appear. And those colonies should represent E. coli that contains the construct. So it represents E. coli that contains our gene construct up here. So we would be creating this which I'm circling up top with my laser pointer in the end scenario here. E. coli cells, on the other hand, that had not accepted this plasmid, empty E. coli cells with no plasmid whatsoever, would not grow in, on this plate because the plate has antibiotic in it. And so this allows us to very easily screen for bacteria that have effectively taken in the plasmid because it's going to be only those cells that will grow on the plate. And then at this point, to further verify, because we always like to validate things, what we would do is grow further the bacteria colonies that we see. And generally sequence, DNA sequence, the plasmid to confirm that it is correct and present. Because it's always possible that there could be a false positive colony here. It's always possible that perhaps you, the experimenter, didn't add the antibiotic to the media, or perhaps it wasn't distributed evenly across the media. And so as a result, you could have some colonies show up that do not actually carry the plasma. And so you need to make sure that Ultimately, the colonies that you have selected to carry on and use as your biochemical factories to make the ultimate protein product appear, you need to make sure that those cells actually have the plasmid and they're going to waste a lot of time trying to figure out what's going wrong in making your protein product. So generally what happens is after these colonies pop up on the plate, those individual colonies are grown further by introducing them into a liquid food, liquid media as it's called, isolating the plasmid construct and determining the full DNA sequence of that plasmid construct. And in the year 2020, once you have an isolated plasmid construct, generally the process of getting the, the DNA sequence of that plasmid construct is a day or less. So it's a very fast procedure to determine the DNA sequence of that plasmid, or at least of the gene that's um, inserted into the plasmid, determining the sequence of at least part of the plasmid to offer confirmation that indeed the E. coli cell does contain the gene of interest. And with that gene of interest in place, then a huge variety of cool things can be done with ultimately the protein that is produced um, and encoded by that gene. So with that, we will stop our tour of the process of genetic manipulation here. As we go through the semester, we will get into this a bit deeper as we go into specific applications of what we can do with this knowledge to actually solve problems in the world of chemical biology.